John chapter 6 is where we will be today. John chapter 6, starting in verse 16. I'm going to go ahead and read for us, and then we'll jump on in. It's John 6, verse 16 through 21 this morning. Here's what God's Word says. When evening came, His disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles... They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. This is God's word. Would you pray with me as as we jump on into it? Heavenly Father, we do confess this is your word. This is what you have written for us and preserved for us, and it's what you have sovereignly had us read and be in today. And so, Lord, as we come to your word, we want to just confess our tendency and our often desire to just simply want to pull the meaning that we we want most, to just filter your word through Um, our desires and our wants, and just walk away with what we want to hear. But God, we just want to lay that down at your feet this morning and ask that you would be our teacher. Would you speak to us and show us what you have for us today? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this Christmas, uh, we discovered something about my my, one of my daughters. Uh, So I have a daughter who's a year and a half, um, she's a year and a half old? That sounds strange. She's one. And uh, we, we went to go get a Christmas tree uh, kind of later in the evening and had to put her down to sleep before we brought the Christmas tree into the house. So the very next morning when she woke up, we brought her out of her, out of her crib and she turned to the corner and just saw this massive tree in our living room, all lit up. And I don't know, it was like a seven foot tree. And so she turns the corner and just stops as she sees this tree, um, and, 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 and just this like wave of terror washes over her face, and we realize, oh, she's really scared of, the, of, cri- of this Christmas tree. And as we just continue to go throughout the month of December, we realize she's scared of all Christmas trees. I don't know what it is about Christmas trees, but every time she sees one, she just kind of like freaks out for a minute, and we would try to bring her close and let her touch the tree and see that it's not scary. But when you're one, and you turn the corner, and you see a, a massive seven-foot tree that belongs outdoors, but for some reason it's indoors, I kind of understand her fear a little bit. Maybe trees just belong outside. But sometimes kids are just afraid of things. And even to us as adults, if those fears don't make sense, um, it doesn't mean that they just go away. Sometimes kids are just afraid of things. They're afraid of the dark. Um, Some adults are still afraid of the dark. Uh, Sometimes kids are afraid of like bad dreams or scary movies or just bad guys in general. And If you've ever had this opportunity, you know what it feels like. Sometimes as adults, we have to comfort the fears of children. And so we'll say things like, oh, you know, it's okay, you're you're safe. Or, you know, that's 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 probably not gonna happen. Or you don't don't you don't need to think about that. Don't don't think about that right now. And I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but the way that we comfort the fears of children reveals a lot about ourselves and maybe how we deal with our own fears. And so I just kind of want to ask us this question this morning of how do you deal with your fear? As you face lots of fears, maybe this week or the last two weeks, we've been faced with COVID once again. Maybe for a while that was kind of been able to put out your mind, wasn't surging as much, but now that it is again, maybe you're dealing with fear of, of getting sick and what might come from that. Maybe you're dealing with the fear of loss. This potential loss in your life keeps you up at night. Maybe you're dealing with the fear of loneliness or the, the, the fear that one day you're going to die and you don't know when that's coming and, and what do you do with that information? Maybe you're dealing with the fear of, of insignificance or not having your plans go the way you hope them to go. How do you deal with fear when it creeps up within you? What do you tell yourself? 
think here's some of the common things we tend to do with our fear. One, sometimes we just lie to ourselves and we say, it's okay, I'm safe. Which, truth is, we're really vulnerable. I don't know that we could tell ourselves that and it'd be true all the time. We're really vulnerable as human beings to a lot of things. Maybe sometimes you, you encourage yourself with the statistics. You know, you play the odds. You say, that's it's probably not going to happen, so therefore I don't need to be afraid. Like, most likely I'm not going to have this happen to me, so it's okay. Or maybe you have a tendency to just do all of the research you can because you think the more informed I am, the safer I am, and the less afraid I need to be. Or maybe you just kind of muscle up and just say, I just got to suck it up, power through, face my fears, and go for it. Or maybe you just run from it and just say, I don't want to think about it. Let me focus on something else. But we all come up with ways to deal with our fear. What's the remedy to your fears? How do you deal with them? As we come to John chapter 6, we see the disciples have to deal with their fear. And as we've been in John chapter 6, we just come off of the heels of a really uh, popular story, a miracle of Jesus, where Jesus feeds somewhere between five to tw- maybe 20,000 people with a small amount of food, with just five loaves of bread and two fish. He miraculously feeds them all with plenty to spare. And the crowd, as they saw Jesus do this, they wanted to make him king. They want, the Bible tells us they wanted to make Jesus king by force. They, they wanted to take this Jesus who could provide all of their material needs and they could feed them. Let's go make this miraculously powerful guy king because maybe he can free us from Roman oppression. He can be the one that leads us back into prominence and maybe he can destroy this empire that's terrorizing us. And it tells us that Jesus departs from them and he goes and withdraws and he goes to spend time with his heavenly father. He goes to spend time with the Lord. And now John, the author of this book, tells us this. As Jesus is away praying, says, When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat, and started across the sea. I don't know about you, it seems like a horrible time to get in a boat to go for a sail across the sea at night. I would wait till the morning. Anyways, John says this, verse 17, It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. And the sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. Now, we've talked about this with the book of John. Every time John, the author, mentions nighttime, he's not just arbitrarily referencing a time of day. He's actually saying something more profound. Oftentimes, he's saying something theological about the darkness and about the nights. And so when John says this phrase, I think he's actually saying something a lot more. He's saying the disciples are alone. Jesus is not with them. They are in darkness and they need the light. And so they set sail across the Sea of Galilee. Now, I don't know if you know much about the Sea of Galilee or have seen it with yourself. It's actually a lake. Um, It's called the Sea of Galilee, but it's actually a freshwater lake in Israel. And um, it's it's not a super big lake. It's about eight miles long, but it's prone to sudden violent storms. It's surrounded by a lot of large mountains, and so wind can kind of come in and whip up the water, and things can go south very quickly. In fact, just a few years ago, there was a a storm with with waves that were about 10 feet high, and these waves were so strong that they destroyed much of the city that was surrounding the Sea of Galilee. And so even though it's a lake, it could get violent storms. I don't know if you've you've seen uh, storms on the Great Lakes, but those things can get crazy. Uh, and so this, this lake here, it's, it's not very big, it's not super deep, but it was prone to some violent storms. And Jesus' disciples are on a boat small enough that you could move it with some paddles. So they're on a very small boat, most likely, uh, in an area where it's prone to violent storms and they're in the midst of a violent storm as they're on this sea. And it tells us this in verse 19. When they had rowed about three or four miles, so right in the middle of the lake, in the sea, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat. Now, the way John writes this, he seems to communicate it very matter-of-factly, as if Jesus is kind of with ease walking on these stormy waves. And it also tells us they're about three to four miles out, which means Jesus has walked three miles from shore out to the middle of this sea on these stormy waves. 
And in case we're missing it, this is miraculous. This is the power of Jesus to to literally be walking on water, to do something that no one has done or can do. And in doing this, he walks to the disciples and he is once again revealing himself to his disciples through miraculous signs. He's saying, yeah, I can walk on water. And he's actually declaring something to them without even saying any words. He's revealing something and declaring something to them about who he is, something very theological. He's actually revealing his own divinity as God to them without saying anything, just by walking three miles out to them on top of the water. And the reason why I think he's declaring something to them just through his actions is because we know this. From the beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, we are told that darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And here in John 6, in the midst of darkness, Jesus is walking over the face of the waters, which is what God does. Or what the author Job tells us in Job chapter 9, he declares that God alone treads on the waves of the sea. And here in John 6, we have the Son of God, we have Jesus treading upon the waves that He made. Jesus is showing His disciples that He is God, that He stands over His creation, that He is the God that controls all of His creation. And a three-mile jaunt on top of a stormy sea is just no big deal for Jesus because of who He is. Now, What a comfort this could be to these disciples, and what a comfort this could be to us. Just the picture of what Jesus is doing here. He's revealing that there's there's no place where He can't reach you. This could be a great encouragement to His disciples for them to know that even when they are three miles out in the middle of stormy seas, there is no place that Jesus can't reach us. He'll come to us. He'll be with us. He'll find us. There's nowhere we can go that is outside of His reach, and it could be a great encouragement to our hearts as well. It reminds me of Psalm 139, where we're told this, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. Listen to this, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. What a beautiful, comforting part of who Jesus is that no matter where we go, no matter where we are, if we are His, He's with us. He comes to us. He finds us. But the disciples didn't seem to be comforted by seeing Jesus walking on the water. Actually, it tells us that they're frightened, that they're terrified. Look at what it says, verse 19. They saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. The disciples are afraid. Now notice, we aren't told that they're afraid of the storm. We're not told they're afraid of the wind or the waves or what's going to happen to their boat. We don't get any sense that They're afraid of those things. It seems as though they see Jesus walking on the water and they are afraid of Jesus. In fact, the other gospels that mention this story tell us that the disciples thought when they were looking at Jesus, they thought he was a ghost. And so they were frightened. Their categories were being shattered as they see this immense power belonging to Jesus, and it terrifies them. And the point is this, that they were afraid of Jesus because they didn't quite recognize who they saw. I can't get around this as I look at this passage, that they are afraid of Jesus. And I think it's because they don't recognize who they were looking at. Maybe they thought up until this point they knew Jesus, but in this moment he scared them. They saw a power that he had that freaked them out. And so it gets me kind of asking this question, how can they be afraid of Jesus? 
Which then makes me take a step back and just ask, well, what does that mean? What does that mean that they're afraid? Well, to be afraid of anything, right, is to have this intense wave of emotion to where we, we perceive that something is threatening to us. Something is going to harm us or hurt us. And so for the disciples in this moment to see Jesus and to be afraid is to somehow come to the conclusion that the power that they're seeing in this person, Jesus walking on the water, is somehow being interpreted to them as threatening, as maybe being harmful to them in some way, which might sound really strange to us. How could someone view Jesus like that? But the truth is, any of us can be afraid of Jesus. Maybe you don't think about it in those terms, but I think whether you are a Christian or not, there are some times when we can believe that Jesus is scary. Let me give you a couple of examples. One could be we, we, we might just be ignorant about who, Je- who Jesus is or ignorant about truths about him. For example, if all you've ever heard about Jesus is maybe from some guy standing on the street corner that says, repent because Jesus is coming back to judge you. If that's all you know about Jesus, I don't think anyone would blame you for being afraid of him, for not wanting to trust someone like that. If you don't know the truth that even though, yes, Jesus is coming to judge, but before he came to judge, he came to earth to save. He came to earth to to save sinners and, and die in their place and offer forgiveness for them. If you don't know that about Jesus and all you know about him is that he is coming as a judge, well, yeah, you might be scared of him. You might not trust him because there's things you don't know about him. So sometimes just being ignorant about truth of who Jesus is can lead us to maybe being afraid of him. If you have no idea that he's good, why would you want to trust him? But sometimes we can even fear Jesus just because we have wrong belief about who he is and what he's like. I'll be honest, there's been times for me I've been fearful of repentance. I see the scriptures call on the life of a follower of Jesus to confess our sins, not just to the Lord, but even confess our sins to one another. And I have had times in my life where I have been terrified of confessing my sins, terrified of repenting of my sins and revealing to someone in my life the sins of my heart, things that I've done. And I'm afraid because I think, well, if I'm exposed, that's going to be harmful for me. It's not going to go well for me. But the truth is, in in that moment, I'm actually afraid of something Jesus is calling me to. It's Jesus that that the one in, in the scriptures that call us to repentance, that call us to confess our sins. And so if I'm interpreting that as, well, if I do that, it's going to lead to some harm for me. It's going to be scary. I'm going to lose favor. I don't want to do that. Ultimately, what I'm saying is I don't trust Jesus. I don't trust the plans that he has will be good for me. I actually think his plans and his calls on my life will hurt me and harm me. And so in many ways, I could say in those moments, I'm actually afraid of Jesus. I'm afraid of what he's calling me to. I'm afraid that if I follow him, it's going to bring pain and suffering and harm to my life. Some of us, maybe this morning, aren't believing that Jesus has our good in mind, and so we are afraid of giving him control. We're afraid it'll lead to our suffering if we really let Jesus be in control of everything. Maybe some of us have come to a wrong belief that Jesus only loves those that are good. And so therefore you you fear him because you fear being exposed by him because deep down you know you're not good. Or maybe some of us have come to the wrong belief that the only thing that pleases Jesus is when we're sinless. And so you fear being honest with him. You run away from repentance because you're afraid of his judgment and his his wrath if he sees your sins. You see, all of us can at times be afraid of Jesus. And 
The reason why that fear happens is because we have a tendency to misunderstand and misidentify Jesus. We start to believe His plans aren't trustworthy, or the life He calls us to is going to harm us, or He won't work everything out for our good, and we start to think He's kind of scary. And I believe that's where the disciples were in this moment. They were seeing Jesus and misidentifying Him. They weren't really understanding who He was, and so to see that amount of power scared them. They didn't know what it would quite mean for their lives. But Jesus knows the remedy to our fears, and it's this. The remedy is to let Jesus define who He is for us. Look at what He says. In verse 20, Jesus now speaks to them, And he says, it is I, do not be afraid. It is I, do not be afraid. Now, this phrase right here, some will look at this phrase, some commentators will, or theologians will look at this phrase and say, all that Jesus is saying here is simply, hey, it's me. Some will look at this and say, this is just a a, a very, very simply Jesus just saying, it's me, Jesus. And so if that is the case, then what Jesus is saying to all of their fears is simply, hey guys, don't sweat it. It's just me, Jesus, walking on the water. And I, I, I don't think that's what Jesus is quite saying here. I think he's saying something much deeper and something much more because the original language in which this is written, in the language of Greek, Jesus is saying a phrase that is literally translated as I am. And so he's saying, I am do not be afraid. And in John's gospel, that phrase out of the lips of Jesus, when he says, I am, that is a phrase that holds prominent status in the gospel of John. We will see it, especially in these next several chapters. When Jesus says, I am, he's not just saying, hey guys, it's me. He's saying something deeply theological. He is saying, I am God. He's revealing his name to his disciples. And it's not just a phrase he came up with. It's a phrase that God has given his people all the way back into the Old Testament. When he has revealed himself, he reveals himself as I am. So I think Jesus is identifying himself now with his words as God to his disciples to not just say, hey guys, don't, don't, don't worry, it's just me, Jesus. I'm just walking on water. No, I think he's coming to them saying, don't be afraid because God is here and he's with you. In fact, flip with me if you, if you have a Bible back to Exodus chapter 3. This is where we see this name of God revealed to humanity. Exodus chapter 3. God appears to Moses. Maybe you're familiar with the story, often referenced as the burning bush, where where God appears to Moses and he consumes a bush with fire, but the bush is not burning, and Moses turns to see this bush, and God speaks to him. In Exodus 3.13, Moses uh, God is going to call Moses to go deliver the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt, and he wants to send Moses to do it. And Moses says to God in verse 13, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. So when Jesus says, I am, he's saying, I am this God. And this is the name that God wants to be known by throughout the generations. And as we read through the scriptures, we see there are several things that this name, I am, means. Several things that it communicates. One of which is that God has no beginning and no end. He has never not existed and he will never cease to exist. He stands outside of time. He has no beginning and no end. He has created everything. And everything 
depends on Him, and yet He is independent of everything. He needs nothing. He needs no one. But actually, everything needs Him to exist. It's a name that communicates that He's all-powerful. He's almighty. That He's constant. That He never changes. That He remains the same forever. That He Himself is the absolute standard of all that is good and all that is true. It's a name that means that God stands above everything and everyone. He always does what He pleases, and whatever He does is always right because of who He is. It's a name that communicates that it's God alone who is preeminent, who is supreme, who is the most important person in all of existence. He's the most important person outside of all existence. He's I am. And Jesus, as he stands on these waves, seeing his disciples afraid, he says, that's who I am. And he's telling these Jewish men who would know their Bibles, he's saying, I am the very same God that spoke to Moses. I am the covenant God, the God who promises himself to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am the God who has led my people out of Egypt. I am the God who has always been with my people. I am the God who is faithful to my people. I am the God who is jealous for their devotion and committed to their protection. He's saying to them, I am the promise keeper, the provider, and the redeemer. I am the creator of the very waves in which I'm standing on. He's saying to them, I am the God who saves. Don't be afraid. But not just that. He's saying, I am this God and... I am here with you and for you. And ultimately, God did not come down to earth just to meet a few disciples in the middle of a dark, stormy sea. He came to the darkness of this sinful world to come to us, to all of us who were alone and in darkness and stuck, and He came to save us from our sins. He didn't just come to walk three miles on water out to the middle of a dark lake. He came all the way from heaven to earth to meet us in the midst of our sin and to die for us as the great I am, to to, to live the perfect life we couldn't live and die in our place and receive the punishment for our sins so that we could be saved. And that anyone who believes in Him will be saved and have forgiveness for their sins. And Jesus communicates all of this to His disciples with just a name, by saying, I am. A name that reveals, one, His power, but two, His nearness his love, his desire for relationship. And so in the midst of their fears, Jesus comes to them and shows them who he is. He declares who he is. He says, I am God. I am the one with all power. And yet I am also the God who is near to you. For the disciples to see this kind of power I can imagine why it would be terrifying. But to see this kind of power wrapped up in the friend, the teacher, the gentle Savior Jesus was comforting. To see that kind of power in a God who is distant and not loving and unpredictable and constantly changing would be terrifying. Or to just see the nearness of Jesus, but Him not have any power is fine, but it doesn't do anything for our fears. But to see the 
the God who's all powerful, but also loving and near and desiring relationship and with them and for them was comforting. And so Jesus' remedy to their fear was this, believe who I am. Believe that I am the almighty, all-powerful God who is also here with you, but not just with you, for you. So for humanity, fear is just kind of a given in our lives. We will be afraid. Jesus doesn't come down to earth and just say, don't ever be afraid. Stop it. No, he, he comes and says, when you're afraid, look to me. When you experience fear, look to who I am. Don't be afraid. I am. Because ultimately our fears are directly tied to what we believe about Jesus. There is a direct link between what we're afraid of and what we believe about Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you are His, then you have an assurance that empowers you to not be afraid. This is what Jesus is telling His disciples, and it's what the Scriptures are telling us over and over and over. If you belong to Jesus, you actually have something. You, you have a truth. You have an assurance that actually gives you real-world power to not be afraid. No matter what it is, maybe for you, it's suffering. You're, you're afraid of suffering. You're afraid of sickness or pain or sadness or ultimately death. But if Jesus is the I am and he promises to be with you, no matter what suffering happens, you'll be okay. In fact, he knows deep suffering and he can sustain you. Or maybe you're fearful of your, your past being exposed Sins you've committed, things that you've done that you're ashamed of and you can't seem to shake and, and you're afraid that one day those are going to get revealed and people are going to judge you and reject you and condemn you. But if Jesus died for your sins and rose for them, then all those sins are forgiven. Even if everyone saw your sins and judged you and condemned you, he doesn't. And there's no one who has an accusation that can overpower the blood of Jesus. Or maybe you have a fear of all of your, your plans not working out. You're afraid that, that ultimately, ultimately there's going to be a future for you and, and a plan that God has, has paid for you that you don't really like. It doesn't go according to what you want. But if Jesus is the I am, then not only are his plans infinitely better than yours, but he also knows your desires and cares for you. And he's actually, if this is who he really is, he's actually more committed to your joy than you are. And so even if your plans don't work out, you'll be okay. Because he's still good and he's still for you. Or maybe you have a fear of being alone. That there's just never going to be a point where you have someone that really cares about you and really knows you and is with you through thick and thin. But if Jesus is I am, the truth is you aren't ever alone. That's not just like theoretical, like, oh, be encouraged. Jesus is with you. No, that's like, that's actually real. 
It's literally what the psalmist in Psalm 139 that we just read is saying, that no matter where I go, even if I am alone, I'm never alone. Maybe you're afraid of being weak. It makes you vulnerable and powerless. But if, if Jesus is the I am, then being weak doesn't have to be as scary. Because it means we, we actually just need to be more dependent on Jesus, who's far more powerful than we are anyways. See, my wife and I, we kind of have this practice every once in a while when one of us is dealing with fear, where we'll ask each other, what's your greatest fear in this? Like, what, what is the deep, like, worst case scenario, the thing that in the midst of all of this you're really afraid of? Like, let's just play this out all the way to the end. What is the big thing you're afraid of? And ultimately what happens is when we, we, we see that thing all the way through, we realize no matter what that fear is, it can't touch anything that Jesus has done for us. No matter what the fear is, will it ever stop my sins from being forgiven? Will it ever cause me to lose the righteousness that Jesus has gifted me? Will it ever cause my eternal inheritance that's guaranteed to ever lose any value? Will it ever lead to me being truly rejected and alone? Will it ever lead to me being condemned ultimately? And the answer to all of those is no. Nothing can touch those things. Because of who Jesus is and what he's done, he has secured those things for his people. And so, there is no fear. I don't care what it is. There is no fear, no matter how massive it is, no matter how irrational it is, no matter how life-shattering it is. There is no fear that does not crumble at the feet of Jesus. And so this is what Jesus is saying to his disciples as he stands where no other human being can stand. And he declares the thing that no one else can declare. He says, I am. Don't be afraid. And the disciples go from being terrified to verse 21. They're glad. It says, then they were glad to take him into the boat. And immediately the boat was at land to which they were going. How did the disciples respond? Once they allowed Jesus to define who he was, they received him with gladness. It's as if they, they, they saw the power of Jesus and they were terrified, but then they realized, oh, that's the God who's with us and for us? Oh, let's go. We're good. Because the power and the presence of Jesus does something to our fears. There's the invitation for us to receive Him with gladness. Because when our fears stand before the power and presence of Jesus, something happens to those fears. I want to read for us Psalm 46 as we close. And as I read it, I want you to be, be listening for where it talks about the power of God and also the presence of God, the nearness of God, and how that addresses our fears. Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble 
at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. When that God who is all-powerful, is with us and for us. We do not need to be afraid. So the question is, what are you doing with your fears? Are you just powering through? Hopping on Google? Do some research? Playing the odds? Just trying to ignore it? There's an invitation for us this morning to bring our fears to Jesus, to the I am, to tell him, God, these are my fears. Even if you're afraid of him and where he'll lead you and what he'll do, tell him. And there's an invitation for us this morning to be still and know that he is God and that he is with us and for us. Let's pray together. As we sit here and respond to the Lord, I want to give you an invitation this morning as you're just sitting wherever you are watching this to just take a moment and tell the Lord your fears. Just lay them out before him. Tell him what scares you. If you can, take that fear to to its very end. Tell him what you're really afraid of. And now let's just take a moment to receive that invitation that's just given to us from Psalm 46 to be still and know that He is God. Know that Jesus is I Am. Just ponder that for a moment. Be still and receive that. Jesus, you are God. You are the Almighty One, the Eternal One, the One who has created everything and sustains everything and holds everything together. And you see our fears. And you sympathize with us in them. And yet you comfort us with truth. You say to us right now where we sit, I am. Do not be afraid. And so God, we ask for your help. Help us believe. Help us become a people. Help our church become a church that believes that that's who you are, Jesus. 
that we become a church that's honest about our fears, but doesn't run from them or hide from them or just try to muscle up, but takes them to you, Jesus. Would you help us in our weakness? Lord, we believe. We believe this is who you are. Pray this in your name. Amen.